No, no, Activists, they're... artists, they're... and citizens from nearly all walks of life and perspectives have struggled to reach beyond the limits of mainstream media. Whether it's Fox News or the New York Times, Rush Limbaugh or Brian Williams, many people say they are tired of being talked to or overlooked. They seek to exercise their own rights to free speech, to fulfill a need to hear from independent voices. They exercise their rights and fulfill their needs by creating new avenues for speech, by inventing new forms of communication, and by seizing the microphone to speak to their community. This movement did not begin and does not end with the internet or social media. It is a movement as old as the dawn of mass media itself. This series will highlight the contributions of alternative media and a political environment that seems to reward those with the most money a political environment that does not necessarily reward those with the best ideas or those who serve the critical information needs of their communities. We're looking beyond mainstream media. My name is Mark Lloyd. I'm the director of the uh, Media Policy Initiative here at the New America Foundation. And as part of our series on beyond mainstream media, we will be talking about low power FM. After a struggle of uh, almost a decade, a little over a decade, Congress uh, and the FCC have finally cleared the way for the largest expansion of low power FM uh, that the country has ever seen. Uh, and I believe the application process starts in October of 2013. Uh, we're going to talk with a few experts here about what this means, why it's important, why it took so long and what this really means uh, for the larger communications needs of uh, communities uh, across the country. And so I am joined here today with uh, Liz Humes. Good afternoon. Uh, Liz is the founder of this W-R-I-R-L-P-F-M in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Uh, one, of the one, of the, one of the founders. And you've been, how, how long were you? Uh, at, uh, with the station? Yeah. I have been with the station since before the launch, so um, about nine, full, nine and a half years now. I raised all the money to launch the station and then was instrumental in developing all the programs and programming. Great, great. And sitting next to, uh, sitting next to Liz is Julia Wierski. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. And Julia is with the Prometheus Radio mm -hmm. Project uh, and also a... Uh, has been for at least a few years a radio producer, <laughs> uh, uh, mainly on the East Coast, if I understand it correctly. That's and uh, could you tell us just a tiny bit about you and Prometheus? Sure. Um, well, I've been working in community radio for about 11 years and uh, came to Prometheus. Um, I grew up in the Philadelphia area, and so I've been following Prometheus for a very long time as they're based in, in Philadelphia as well. And we advocate. Um, on behalf of uh, community radio stations, um, both at the FCC and then also out in the field, and helping with the, um, we've helped with the eventual build out of those stations as well, which we call barn raisings, where we build, the, bring the community together to um, actually bring the station, put it on, and get it on the air. Great, so. great. Mm -hmm. And sitting next to Julia is my old friend, well, my, my good friend. We've known each other for a while. I shouldn't call you an old friend. Old is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Grinswich, uh, U.S. Catholic Conference, uh, or U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I almost always get that wrong. So well, this has been such a long struggle, the name changed. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that, is that right? So, and uh, if, I, if I understand it correctly, you are an associate general counsel? I'm an assistant general counsel. That changed, too. Wow. It's been so long. <laughs> Now, so te why, why are the Catholic bishops interested in radio, and what's your connection with that? You know, that's an interesting question, and that's what Bill Kennard asked in 1999 when we convened a meeting of church organizations, community organizations mm -hmm. at United Church of Christ downtown here in D.C. and met with Bill Kennard to explore this idea of low-power FM, tiny radio stations. And the first question is, well, what do the Catholics care about that? Mm -hmm. And the Catholics care, as many churches do, because communications is what you do. You want to convey your religious message. You want to convey your cultural message. You want to convey um, um, social justice messages. And these are not messages that are well-received on commercial radio or television stations. These are, are 
um, they're not commercial by their nature. And so we were very interested in allowing um, parishes, schools, um, other Catholic, uh, small Catholic institutions to, to at least get programming on new stations or establish new stations. So that was our, that was our hope at a time when we found everything else was, was coming to an end. You know, our access to community or to, to commercial TV and radio was, was, was being squeezed out. So, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the struggle to get low power FM off and running uh, uh, and what it is to run a low power FM station and, uh, and how folks can actually get their own low power FM stations. But we have a, a short clip that uh, sort of helps explain a little bit about uh, community radio that I believe Prometheus mm -hmm. Uh, has uh, put together and uh, and is allowing us to run. So why why don't we just sort of show that short clip about community radio? Everybody's voting for the friendly voice of radio, the people's choice. <laughs> When we don't have the media, and or the media is controlled by another group that doesn't have our side of the story, our perspective, our community interest, and other people hear from them, and we have nothing to combat that. We have, we don't have our own radio station, our, our newspaper, to put our truths out there, our version, our perspective out there, then in a way they control the battle. We have to fight for those spaces. Like we, we as social justice movement builders need to really own spaces um, and be able to control narratives um, because we believe that like the people know how to tell their own stories and they know the solutions to their own problems. How do we get accurate information to our folks? You know, how do we have authentic conversations across borders and boundaries that divide us? I think community radio is one of the tools that can really start bringing folks together um, to get in the practice of working with each other and to get in the habit of leading dialogue and sharing information about issues that's important to where we are. They actually have to look at themselves and, and tell and hear their own stories. Then you start to see people kind of open up and they, and they become proud of who they are. And so if we had our own radio station where the people could call in and talk about what they're going through, how they're being mistreated, how the injustice that's going on, it would be an outlet that would be an in-source and an outsource at the same time that could release and get out to the world some of the things that are going on in that area. This really is about telling the stories and using the stories to push policy so that folks can really build a world that includes their visions. And that's one of the promises of, of Low Power FM, is that you can set the criteria that you won't play buffoonery. You won't play music that, that advocates violence. Because that's not the only music that's out there, but that's what's been put in mainstream radio. And that's another reason why the radio station is so important, so you can hear different voices, you can hear positive messages. It's just about like channeling all that creative energy. Like there's so much energy and talent out there that it just needs to be like streamlined. To organize, galvanize, and educate uh, community stakeholders and policy makers. That helps our community to grow. And um, preserve the cultural identity of our neighborhoods. Sería mejor también que haya más estaciones de radio comunitarias a nivel del país. Y creo que ayudaría a todas las organizaciones en diferentes partes de tener una sola voz y tener muchas estaciones comunitarias para cada campaña en diferentes luchas y así es más fácil comunicar con todos. I definitely support. I 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 support
Community radio. 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 Hundred percent. Community radio. Community radio. Community radio. One hundred percent. Low powered, people powered community radio. We need community radio. Don't you think so? opportunities that are coming well that, that that so so why why joy do you get excited why is this a big deal uh, you know you I, get emotional I about do it. I do um, I, I've seen it firsthand I've mm -hmm. seen it in just the um, relationships that I've been able to build through the station that I've worked at um, and I've seen what it I've seen what impact it can have in the community um, and I imagine that, you know, and that's just a, at a station that predominantly operates as a, as a music-driven station. And so when I think of other stations that have um, other varied kinds of missions to their work and what can be accomplished there and what, you know, Prometheus scene that has been accomplished and, and other communities across the U.S., um, it's, it's overwhelming. I, I feel like a couple standout examples always get mentioned, but to me, what I think is most exciting is what we don't know what's hap going to happen next in this next wave. Um, the last application windows have been predominantly in rural areas, um, and the next wave that's is, is going to open up spots in urban areas, which are going to reach a whole, you know, many more people and other kinds of communities. And so it's it's to me we don't even it's it's all you know it's not just projection. We know that these these great groups are going to get these licenses, and I can't wait to see it happen. So. So, uh, so, Liz, what is the real difference between low power FM and full power FM? And what, what is the difference between these stations? For us, okay, my programming, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, is news and talk, uh, news and public affairs. Uh, primarily, it's like social justice programming. At night and on weekends, it's music. Um, for us, the primary difference, I think, is everything is done from the bottom up. Uh, all decisions are made by committee, by vote. And then the board of directors manages decisions that involve multiple com committees. So if a decision by news crosses over into the rights of the music department or to the uh, marketing department or something else, then the board of directors gets involved. But it's not based on one person's taste or understanding of what the radio station is or should be. It's, it's based on, on the community's understanding of what we can do and what it should be and programming and voices that need to be heard or genres that need to be heard. And I think more than anything else, we are absolutely not economically driven. We drive to support ourselves and to maintain ourselves, but if we want to add programming that's potentially, um, no, I don't want to say unpopular, but controversial, we'll do it because it's, it's necessary. If it, it addresses an issue that's necessary or a genre that's, that's necessary, then, then we'll do it. And it's not, it's not because it makes money for us. You know, a lot of important issues aren't popular. You know, and that's what we want to, that's what we need to talk about. Now, do the, the same rules that apply to commercial radio apply to low power FM? Um, be more specific. Uh, the way that you raise money, the, the commercials that you run, um, what you can say on the air. Uh. <laughs> so to be a nonprofit public radio station, the biggest, there are two big no-nos that you can say and can't say regarding raising funds. Mm -hmm. One of which is you cannot, we cannot endorse um, a candidate or a person running for public office or an issue of public concern that is coming up for a vote. So, you know, um, Tim Kaine. I can't go on the airwaves during an election season and tell people to vote for Tim Kaine. Who, uh, and then also we cannot tell people how to spend their money. So we can't say, go here and check out this new album. We can't say, go to you know, coffee shop XY and, and buy this coffee, we say. More information is available here. 
Um, our intention is tied up. We are, we are there to educate, not to solicit or aid anyone in solicitation. And that is the drive of our content, is, is education. And so therefore, the, w that's what distinguishes us as a, as a nonprofit public station, is we are there to educate, not you know, serve solicitors. Does that make sense? Yeah, that okay. uh, I, I I guess it I, <laughs> I, guess, well, I, know I, I I I guess it makes sense. But now uh, will I will I see an ad for uh, detergent or shampoo or uh, or hear an ad for detergent or shampoo on the on the radio station? Uh, yeah, sure. If it, yeah. you know, if it falls under underwriting. It falls under underwriting, exactly. Yeah. You and, know. And there's different ways that the ad copy is written for that, um, you know, or not ad copy, but the copy that would be read over the airwaves. Um, yeah. So that, that's a little different. But, and it certainly doesn't sound like uh, a commercial, you know, it, it doesn't have that kind of interruptive quality that um, is so prevalent on commercial, commercial radio. And um, I might also um, hear NPR. Mm -hmm. on a low-power FM station. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, WRAR was the first uh, LPFM station to carry NPR, American Public Media, and Public Radio International. And we were, for many, many years, the first, uh, the only station that carried these three major public radio syndicates. And then, actually, we just dumped them all. Um, <laughs> Just this last, uh, so our fiscal year started in July, and we just got rid of all of our, our subscriber syndicated programming. We feel like the world of independent media producers is so vast and so diverse and is so underrepresented that we're established. And now it's time to represent new voices and, and, a, different, and a, different, um, a different echo, I guess. So Catherine, let me, let me ask you. Um, uh, in addition to um, radio that features NPR, uh, there are also um, religious broadcasters who I think have uh, actually taken fairly good advantage of low power FM as, uh, as a service, particularly in rural America. Um, are there, is there any difference between um, the sort of religious programming that you would hear on a low power station as opposed to maybe a commercial AM station or? This would be, um, from a Catholic perspective, there's, there's a couple of places that programming would come from. There are larger corporations like Eternal Word Television Network and they supply some radio programming. So for fledgling stations, for example, that are run by independent Catholic organizations, they would take some chunks of that as you would from NPR and fill the day with that. But then part of that, their, their radio day would be populated by local messages and local churches and local parishes and local Catholic schools. So it can be an interesting mix. But you don't see that kind of, even the well-funded EWTN is increasingly um, zeroed out of commercial cable because there's, as you know, there's the cable operators would tend to prefer programming they own or control, and they don't own or control EWTN or programming like that. So that may be now the kind of programming you'll hear on low power FM. Um, but I think it's interesting that the, the, the whole part of this equation is, for me, the question is how does one raise enough money in order to pay for the fees associated with music. And I think that's an interesting area, you know, that, that one would have to take that into account in budgeting for a low power FM. Mm -hmm. So how, how yeah, do you do that, that? The music fees, BMI and ASCAP, those are negligible. Even the um, digital, the digital millennial copyright and streaming, it's, it's negligible, really, really, compared to, I don't know, it's not, it's not as much as rent, it's a few thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And, and also, there's some been really great strides by other organizations to meet that need. Mm -hmm. um, for example, WFMU in Jersey City uh, was a major partner behind the Free Music Archive, which is a, an, a free archive that people can access uh, where artists have um, uh, let their curators mm -hmm. uh, curate this collection of music that is available for free that uh, stations can rebroadcast or can be used for, um, you know, in Creative Commons license. Uh, you know, they, they have uh, a couple different, very easy to navigate under the contracts w under which songs can be used and music can be accessed there to meet that need, because um, that was a big concern 
So um, there's even music that's ready to go for these stations, you know, if, even if they haven't amassed a music library yet of their own, um, that, they, that there, is a, there is a library available to them on the internet. So, so um, I, I know Catherine is interested in that question because a lot of work that she does relates to copyright and licensing uh, issues and things. So, but so Catherine, let me ask you, why, why was it such a battle to get what seems to be such a simple service uh, up and running? And why, why was there such a fight against it on the part of other broadcasters, even the public broadcasters? Even public like, why, broadcasters. Why, why, why was there such a fight? And that's a great question, too. And that's one that I kept having to answer before my committee of bishops year after year after year after year of saying, why is this such the small service that seems to serve such an important need, why would anybody care? Why would this become a problem among higher paid lobbyists in Washington? And we didn't think it was going to be a problem when we were inventing it in 1999 and 2000. Um, the FCC opened the proposed rulemaking. Everyone had a chance to comment. The uh, engineering rules were hammered out. The rules on ownership were hammered out. We all had a chance. No sooner had those rules gone into effect, it took a matter of weeks before the lobbying organization for broadcasters, the National Association from the Broad for Broadcasters, swept onto the Hill and informed them that these three-mile radius stations would interfere with full-power AM and FM broadcasting stations. We disagreed, um, but they had such an enormous amount of lobbyists, and they had such enormous reach that before we could even get in the door of congressmen that summer, the NAB had effectively convinced them that these small radio stations could possibly interfere, and therefore the number of channels available should be shrunk so that there'd be greater physical separation between a small, literally a campus radio station and a full power station. Um, Which I and signal interference. Right. Yeah. And obviously the engineering was incorrect. So the most we could do at that point was to get Congress to at least establish a path where we could prove our case again. So that um, the FCC was required to conduct a study to indicate again that the engineering that had been previously put out to the public was accurate and there was no interference. And that took until 2003. But having, create, having reestablished the rules by a, an act of Congress, by a statute, now in 2003 we had to enact a bill to change the statute to bring back the channels. And that was the hard part because it's a variety of things. The NAB may have felt simply that they needed to establish to its members that they had the power to kill even a friendly little service like this. And I think that was their reasoning. And so they continued to press Congress to not pass any bills allowing more channels for low power FM in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, until 2010. And part of, the, part of working on the Hill is that you get different staffers who have to be re-educated again and again. But their default argument was the one originally promoted by the NAB. That's the one they remembered. And that's where Prometheus was absolutely essential. They were absolutely dogged. I was ready to say, I give up, uncle, it's not going to happen. It simply isn't going to happen. And they would not give up. They were there for every meeting, dragging in people from around the country to show what great, uh, great service this was. Engineers at Prometheus could simply lay out in a, in a simple to understand you know, manner why this does not interfere. And if it wasn't Prometheus, this would not have happened. It simply wouldn't have happened. So how, how was Prometheus able to continue this fight? I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, that members, uh, uh, that church members donate money to the Catholic Church, and that somehow that money allows the Catholic Church to continue to uh, battle some of these things. But how does Prometheus <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> continue? It's like, where, where does the money come from for you to be able to promote and continue the battle around these, these things against the NAB, against uh, National Public Radio. I, I would have to say that. How do you do it? Yeah. <laughs> dogged, um, dogged determination. I mean, we're from Philadelphia. 
we're a pretty scrappy bunch. Um, we do a lot with a little, and um, thankfully, the community of, of, of community media activists that are based in Philadelphia um, were able to draw support from across the country to just keep the pressure on and not give up. Um, you know, <laughs> at one point, you know, when I first started at Prometheus, and we were in a, the basement of a church with, you know, eight people to like two rooms, everybody cramped in, just like hammering away at, at this work. Um, so, you know, and I wasn't even there during that, necessarily that, during that policy fight, but that there is just this, this determination to see it through. The harder and more absurd the restrictions and, and, and things that people are coming back and saying, um, like, the, you know, about the interference and, and all of this, it almost made it even stronger, like, okay, we can, we can take this on. We can take this on, we can prove them wrong, we can build support around this. And also, I think the larger field of community radio, it really solidified that, you know, kind of as you said, that these, these staffers that need to be kind of continuously re-educated about, uh, you know, what changes are being made to this bill. And um, in the same way, the, the field of community radio continued to grow and, their uh, supporters were able to kind of work with their community to show like this is actually, this is what we need and this is why we need it. And these people are working to get it done. We need to join them and, 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 and pull our forces together. So Prometheus definitely could not have done it without the broad coalition of groups that we worked with. I mean, it, it, there really needed to be a bipartisan approach to, to taking it on and so I'm, I'm it's, it's a testament to community organizing and, and grassroots outreach to people to just educate them on the issue and make sure it felt relevant to their lives and worth their time and effort and money to, to pull it off. Well, getting it this, this far is clearly a success. I mean, you're, you've, you've moved things uh, quite a bit for such a small thing, but I know it takes, it takes a, a, a good deal of effort. And Liz, you actually sort of built a place uh, that has now been embraced by the city and by the federal government. You've got a real success story. I do, and actually my success story, I want to follow what she is saying in that we, in 2006, 2007, my radio station is WRER in Richmond, Virginia, we went into a partnership with the city of Richmond. Uh, the city of Richmond had received a grant from Homeland Security to partner um, to form a radio station for the dissemination of emergency information. And then they came to us and said, will you do this? After, after a series of meetings, they said, you know, will you be our broadcast partner? We took that, I took that to Prometheus and what Pete Tredish did, now they were, they were battling at this time and, and selling, their, selling LPFM to, to Capitol Hill. Pete Tredish said to me, who was with Prometheus, said that our partnership with the city of Richmond in this emergency services contract took the conversation from LPFMs being a bunch of hippies to actually, and this is, this is a quote from Pete, he said, we were perceived as a bunch of hippies and it made it, um, it, it verified the project and what LPFM is able to do community by community in that it's an actually a life-saving device and something that the municipalities and the government can use. And it changed, it changed the perception. And, it, and, and we um, professionalized LPFM in a lot of ways because of this, this contract. And it just it was the right place at the right time. You know, we were there, they received the money, we were founding, we knew the right people, and it just all came together. And we were willing to do it. We said, of course. But it, but it proved that LPFM was just more than a bunch of kids who wanted to play music on the radio, that we, as citizens, are passionate, and we want to talk about our passions, you know, passions for our community. So, uh, but why low power FM in Richmond? Why not another FM station in Richmond? And why, do, and why isn't radio just sort of old and passe? Isn't everything moving on the internet? Why do we even, why do we need this service now? Like what's the... Uh, what is it about yeah, radio? Why, yeah, why do we care? I don't want to Go, please, please, please. I mean, uh, speaking to, I mean, there's a lot of, in, you can think about it in terms of like what the life-saving um, aspects um, of, of what stations can do. I mean, I, I think about, there's, there's, there's two things. I, when I was thinking about this question that really resonated with me, particularly in this moment, about why um, a low-power radio station and, and locally owned community radio station is um, so crucial in these times. And 
I don't know if anybody remembers in 2002 the Minnow train derailment disaster in um, North Dakota, where um, there was a, a derailment of this train, um, toxic ammonia was released, and people were trying to reach the local radio stations to, to have them put out this emergency information to let people know to stay inside, that this had happened, um, that there was all, you know, all these risks and danger. And they couldn't get in touch with anybody at the radio stations because they were owned by Clear Channel and were running on automation, and no one was actually there to interrupt the broadcast and say, this is happening. Um, and you know, just earlier this month, we've seen you know, another, you know, another train accident that happened in Canada, and you know, like, you know, 50, I think it was like 53 people died. And, and these things happen. And there needs to be ways for people to get the in, in life-saving information that's crucial for their um, com cru crucial for their communities. But wouldn't like wouldn't Twitter, wouldn't like social media, just sort of handle these problems now? I mean, why why would you need a radio station? Like, I, I'd say there was an article just today that was reported that only one in three homes in West Virginia have a computer. You know, the reality is not everyone has broadband. The reality is not everyone has computer access. Your computer access could be limited to that small period of time that your public library, if you're lucky to have one, is open for that. Mm -hmm. In my neighborhood, I, we have only so many computer terminals on Capitol Hill, on Capitol Hill for our local, re our local library, and they're used constantly. That's not the way you get breaking news. It's not the way you listen to programming, because mm -hmm. that's a limited sliver of time. Mm -hmm. um, that radio still reaches everyone. Everyone can afford a radio. Yeah. I mean, if you're old, if you're elderly, if you're if you're low income, a radio is something you can afford, mm -hmm. and everybody can be reached by radio. I would so. also say that, like, I don't know if uh, anyone here has read the comment section on a web page recently or in a <laughs> internet chat room. It's not exactly <laughs> the place where I would want to have a civil conversation. And you know, just this past weekend in Philadelphia, um, after the uh, Zimmerman verdict was was announced. There was one station in Philadelphia that interrupted regular programming, a commercial station, um, that interrupted their programming for, for maybe about an hour and was taking calls. And at the end of the hour, they, they were, you know, they're clearly, the phone lines were lit up. People wanted to have a conversation. People wanted to talk to one another. They wanted to voice their opinions, their um, frustrations. Their, they wanted to talk to each other. And at the end of the hour, the, the broadcasters had to say, we have to go back to our regular programming because this is we have advertisers and this is like this is all the time we have and it was heartbreaking to see that be the 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 way that that conversation closed and so i see community radio as being an opportunity to speak to one another um, and have you know another kind of moderated conversation that is really with the people that are in your community. And that, you know, sometimes that happens on the internet. That's true. If your community is lucky enough to have broadband or lucky enough to have people that can access it and want to communicate that way. But for other segments of the population that don't have that, it's, that's not the case. And it, it's, it's crucial for them to be able to have that outlet. So. so, and Liz, you devoted a good part of your young life to <laughs> Running a, a low power FM. So, but why? Why radio? And is it? Uh, is is your radio station on the internet? Yeah, we stream too. So you're on the internet as well. Yeah. Not just broadcasting. Right. But I think there's hard division between broadcasting and. No well, you broadcast. have to be both now. Yeah. You yeah. do. You know, people pick us up on on their smartphones and plug their smartphones when they're out of signal area into their into their radio in the car. Um, you were why radio, mm -hmm. as opposed to Twitter. I think you know what you were saying about the the rarity or or the exclusivity of of being able to afford having a computer in your home, and and that everybody has radio. I think, I think is exactly right. I think every car that is that is made today still has a radio in it for some reason. You know, when the power goes out, you're not going to be able to use your computer. Granted, smartphones are skewing my answer very much, and smartphones have been the last two years in this Twitter thing. But two years ago, you know, people didn't use their smartphones to listen to the radio or to communicate. If there was an emergency, you can go out and turn on your car. You can't plug in your computer and, and find out what's happening, or you turn on your radio in your kitchen. Um, 
But more than that, radio allows for a longer, more personalized, in-depth conversation on an issue. You hear a human being talking. You hear an inflection. You hear sadness. You hear you know, a tremble. And it's so much more than, than reading. It's a personal connection when you're alone in your house, when you're alone in your car. It's, it's a human being. And then for me, it's always, it's, it's, doing something with my mind while I'm doing something with my hands, you know, and so when I'm cooking dinner or filling out paperwork, it's the radio is on. It's 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 a human connection and it's thoughts and ideas and it's not being alone in the world, you know. So all right, so I'm 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 watching this and I'm convinced radio is important that I can actually, you know, run a radio station and actually have a radio station on the internet and actually on a smartphone and other things. But so now how how do I Julia, how do I apply <laughs> for this opportunity? Now what what do I do? I'm, right, right. Um, so I hope you're all excited. Uh, if you're ready to go, <laughs> we'll get you signed up. Um, first thing you should know is that these uh, non commercial licenses are awarded by the FCC to nonprofit groups. And so that can be a school, um, local government entity, a native tribal entity, um, so, but they're not, in, they're not granted to individuals. So this opportunity is really um, a, a chance for people to look within their community and say, what groups here could really um, support the operation uh, you know, and, and mission of taking on a radio station project? So that's the, that's the first thing that, that one would, would have to, to, to know for your community. Um, to find out if there are frequencies available in your community, Prometheus developed a free tool. It's our zip code. Uh, finder, and you can find that on any page of our website, which is prometheusradio.org. You can simply type in your zip code, and it'll tell you how many frequencies are available. It can't get any simpler than that. And we have more advanced uh, engineering software that is also uh, available for free uh, as well. But the the main details is is that it's October fifteenth through the 29th of this year. It's a two week period um, where you would have to submit your application online to the FCC, and that's it. That once that window closes, you know, there are many markets in the United States that will ha not have any other available space left on the dial. So, you know, we've been saying this is really like the last opportunity because um, there's been a lot of competition, um, f especially now that these licenses are available in urban markets and the top 150 radio markets. And so, you know, f some of these, these markets haven't had a locally owned station um, go on the air in decades. And so this is really, this is really it. So we encourage people to come to our website, get, get free resources from us. Uh, we'll answer your questions and try to help move you along the process uh, and, and get, you, get your community prepared uh, to apply, which is again this October. Right. And yeah. Prometheus is doing regular webinars? Yes. On this also? Yes, we have um, a series of webinars. They're starting to get increasingly more technical as we start to move through the application. Um, but don't worry, that's what we're here for. <laughs> we'll help you figure it out. Um, so we have free webinars. We have a, also a community called radiospark.org, which we created to help the larger field of community radio be able to communicate with one another. So um, nationwide, people have been chiming in to say, you know what, I can't start a radio station, but I know how to operate a board, or I'm an engineer, or I was a DJ at my college radio station, and I'd love to help out your project. How can I help you? Or I have these resources, or I'm a lawyer, and I'd be happy to help you with this part of uh, your application if you need that help. So radiospark.org has been a really great resource for people, uh, community radio enthusiasts, to, to, to gather and, and figure out how they can uh, share their skills. We've also reached out to existing community radio stations and LPs to have them upload their station manuals and documents so that there can be a, a real sharing of, of information to make this next wave go, uh, go as smoothly as possible. So, uh, Catherine, do you have any cautions about the application process? I think you need to be taking this seriously. I, I would not like a small organization to think of this as a, a little project. I mean, this is an application before the FCC. You're going to have to show a certain amount of engineering um, wherewithal. You're going to have to show financial wherewithal. You're going to have to meet the legal obligations that, or the legal requirements that you be locally owned, prove that ownership. But that being said, this isn't impossible. I mean, these could be small organizations that have, have gone through the IRS uh, uh, procedure to get their 501c3. So this is all very doable. But it's a question of being prepared, going through it step by step, and I think especially getting your financial act in order, because that's the first question I get asked when 
dioceses call, and it's the last question, how much is it going to cost me? Mm -hmm. How much will it cost to get it running, and how much would it cost to keep it running? You know, and can I do that? And, and that's another aspect that the FCC is also encouraging um, if, if there are many organizations within a community that has an available channel, encouraging them to work together. This could be a station operated by a number of organizations. Um, there would have to be a certain amount of legal framework for that, but, but that's very doable. And I think that's something that I'm encouraging people who might even look at a $15,000 financial obligation for the initial setup as a big obligation and are a little afraid of that to say, you don't need to be alone doing this. You know, you could perhaps just donate your talent. You know, if your talent is programming, you could do that and not be the owner. You know, or you could become a part owner. Um, it, that's all, again, quite doable. Because the FCC's requirements are also different for low power than for full power. You don't need to be operating 24 hours a day. Right. You're only operating for a portion of the day for at least five days a week, depending on whether you're an educational association or not. You know, and I think there, too, schools need to be educated here because they can certainly, I mean, this, this service was created with them in mind, as well as other community organizations, and they've certainly got the people power. You know, so I think that's a good place to start, is with existing you know, educational institutions. So I think Nick is going to help us uh, in a short bit, or maybe Anthony's going to help us uh, get questions from the audience. But uh, let me ask you, Liz, uh, are, are, would you suggest this as a piece of cake running uh, uh, low power FM station and uh, you know like a hundred volunteers and this is this is just like putting on a show every day right? This is, <laughs> you know right? I, I, I was trying I, <laughs> I was trying not to smirk when Catherine was talking because I was thinking that's the easy part. <laughs> Getting started, we have 200 volunteers. We want to run 24-7, and they are individual people with individual needs and ideas and directions and ethics and habits. And, um, and it's an amazing thing to do, and it's really worth it. It gives your life purpose and passion, and, and um, you know, I wouldn't change anything. But it's, it's yeah, <laughs> that's just the beginning. <laughs> So do we have any questions from uh, folks here in the audience? Oh, sorry. I'm the chairman of a board of a nonprofit. It's a youth media organization. Um, we do a lot of, um, we train young people in media skills and photography for so social justice kind of campaigns and help them find their voice. And we've been approached by somebody who wants to do this, somebody with a radio background who has the engineer in place, who has the lawyer in place. So, I mean, everything looks good, but at the same time, you know, I'm the chairman of the board, so I have you know, fiduciary responsibilities. And my concerns are, do I open the organization up to any sort of liability by doing this? You know, I, if you're going to accept money, you know, you're responsible for compliance. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's the re re fiduciary responsibility as, as board president. Um, so yes, you are, but I, you know, I wouldn't put my name on any grant or donation that I couldn't meet the requirements of. So I don't know if it would be any different than what you're already working within now. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be because we're not regulated by the FCC right now. <laughs> I guess that's my biggest concern is opening us up to outside regulators and understanding all of that before I sign my name, you know, on a dotted line. Sure. So Prometheus does have some uh, resources available on our website to help answer some of those questions. Yeah. Um, it's, it gets into a little bit more thorn thorniness than, than maybe this is the right space for right okay. now, but I can definitely get you in touch with those resources to answer those questions. Because um, we, uh, we understand that that's obviously not going to be a fit for every type of organization. And um, that, yeah, that those concerns are real and um, we, we'd be more than happy to help you navigate that. That'd be great. You know, as an LPFM, we are not subject to nearly the um, filing and, uh, you know, and everything else that full powers have to keep up with. I mean, okay. it's really, they, they've minimized it so that the community can do it as a volunteer. Um, it's, really, it's really pretty easy and it's a matter of just setting policy mm -hmm. for your people in the beginning, you know, on, on process. It's, it's pretty easy. 
Yeah, and I would say that that probably goes to, that speaks to like what, and when we talk about capacity and, and what it takes to get a station uh, off the ground, that yeah, setting those policies early um, and making sure that you have um, the right kind of buy-in from the people that are, are there that are willing to participate um, and, and, and creating those policies will go a long way to ensuring that they're followed <laughs> and that you have something that runs a little bit more well-oiled um, than trying to just like bring everybody on board first and then figure it out as you go along. We definitely don't recommend, <laughs> recommend that that way. So, so we, we, we can definitely point you in the right direction um, to get those kind of and questions. And I'm wondering where do you distribute your programming now or how do you distribute the programming you do create? YouTube. You know, oh, on YouTube. Um, social media. Um, you know, because there's a certain. I'm just thinking this through. There's a certain level of, of liability there. There is, and so that we, you're responsible you were, for the content. Exactly. And exactly, and we're familiar with that, and that feels real comfortable to me. I think there's right now there's the fear factor, mm -hmm. you know, which I have been to your Prometheus's website, and I want to commend you. Um, it's excellent, and it's been really helpful so far. It's gotten us to the point where we filled out the board questionnaires in order to move forward. That sort of thing. So. Right. Yeah. And I would recommend that I even, I've gone on their website several times just to find random um, places where I've lived or I have friends that live to see, does this work? Can I understand whether or not, because I'm not an engineer um, <clears throat> and I don't play one on TV, so <laughs> but I understand when I get the answer, can a radio station fit here? I get it. It's understandable. So it's a really useful tool just to begin to clear the deck to say, is this even a possibility? Well, then let's look at it. Yeah. Okay, thank you both very much, all of you very much. Uh, my question is for Liz. Your station in Richmond, is it downtown? And if it is, how do you interact with the local music scene? Um, yes, it's downtown. Um, and how do we interact? <sighs> we air, we have quite a few programs that are nothing but local music. We bring in live bands into the studio. This weekend, we're putting on an event that's got 20 local bands. Um, we are making our own community, you know, um, and our community is making us. We are, we are, you know, our DJs are musicians, you know. <laughs> I mean, it just, we are Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, and so we are, we are everybody. They come through, we cater to them, they cater to us. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but there's definitely a space for local music and, uh, and we give back to our local community constantly. And I think the music piece is an important part of Low Power FM because, let's face it, what would, what would make you want to tune in to a local station? It would probably be music you don't have to hear 50,000 times in a week mm -hmm. on yeah. some commercial radio station. You know, I ask people my age to say, well, perhaps this isn't the best example. Well, when's, when was the last time you heard something from Bonnie Raitt from her Lavender album on the radio? You haven't. You know, that there's a need in radio to actually hear music that's actually chosen by individual people yeah. who can come up with something approaching curated. a musical experience. Right. Yeah, it's curated programming or right. curated music. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. And it also can, um, it also can go to preserving um, cultural heritage yes. and yeah. in some areas. We have, there's a station, KOCZ in Opelousas, Louisiana, that their, their, their main, part of their main mission is to just preserve local Zydeco heritage, that music you know, came from that area and yet there had been no station that was broadcasting that music. And so their low power station actually made it so popular again that it started to get picked up by the commercial radio stations. So clearly there was a desire for it um, and that need wasn't being met because it didn't meet a national consolidated playlist that someone, you know, thousands of miles away picked out for that region. So there are really a lot of opportunities for, um, for, for diverse music programming to happen. My name is Clint Sloan. I'm with the National Religious Broadcasters, and I was wondering, um, with this expansion, do you see any potential conflict between high-powered and low-powered radio stations? I don't think so, and, and let me explain my experience with the, the national religious broadcasters that um, so, or, well, when we were on the cusp of finally passing the necessary legislation to expand low power FM, we, the religious broadcasters were very frank with us and said that we would have been with you all this time, but as you can imagine, we have a large and diverse board 
and not everyone could agree. And if there is one voice that's not in agreement with the, a policy position, we won't take it. But for the most part, they were is supportive of low power. They certainly never got in the way. They never you know, stated that this is going to be a, a huge problem for them, particularly as the years went on, because they could see that there's really no conflict. There's no conflict in terms of financial problems, because if you're a full power commercial station, you're not competing with a, a, a small station that is non-commercial. And when it comes to full power um, non-commercial uh, stations, again, it's a very different donor base. You know, I, I don't think the WAMU here in DC is going to suffer if there's a small radio station that covers three or four miles on the outskirts of DC. There would be two different donation uh, 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 funding sources. So, and I think that full power uh, religious broadcasters understand that. If anything, these stations could provide an additional outlet for programming, which is good for everyone. And to speak to the technical aspect of just you know low power versus full power, the onus is on the low power station to assure that it will not cause interference. And in fact, an, an their application would not make it through the FCC if that demand wasn't met. And should an LP get on the air um, and at other times due to if antennas change or locations change or anything like that, um, all of those changes are, again, it's the responsibility of the low power FM broadcaster to correct any interference uh, that may happen um, due to any other changes that happen after the application goes through. So it's really um, fail safe in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's so many checks that it goes, that an application would go through in that process before going on the air that it's not, um, com it's not a signal competition for, for, the, for the full power or in any of the other ways that um, have been outlined um, in terms of competing interests or anything like that. And it, 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 is it any of your, do you have the sense that this is uh, progressive or conservative or liberal or, I mean, is, does low power FM sort of adhere to some particular party or ideology or is it all over the map? I think if you, can, if you go to the FCC's website and check out just the names of current low power FM licensees, you'll see a huge range. It's going to be everything from Our Lady of Perpetual Hope Church, which is going to have a message that's going to be far different from, the, um, um, from a, um, a local Zydeco station. But let a lot of the thousand flowers bloom. I think there was one great intersection that I always, um, um, I am old, aren't I? Nobody's <laughs> right. That, the, uh, but there's that that nice intersection happened in Florida with the uh, with the workers program. That there are uh, there were workers working in the fields that are largely picking uh, crops that are used by McDonald's and other large corporations um, in their food processing, and they had some serious um, uh, labor issues with their working conditions. But nowhere were they getting any news coverage of this long ongoing struggle, which was actually picked up a little bit in Florida, but not on an ongoing basis. The US Conference of Catholic Bishops actually gave a grant to them through, not through its, com you know, its communications program, but through its social justice program to say, we need, you need to continue your struggle to have decent working conditions. Those workers decided, well, no one else is reporting. Let's get a radio station. So now they have a radio station. And so they were reporting on their local issues and other local issues. You know, so that you can get even a, a, an organization like the Catholic Conference, which is going to have as the bishops would call it, a prophetic message, which is not popular. Mm -hmm. And that includes everything from contraceptive coverage, no abortion, to preserving the rights of workers for a decent life. So we think that we're a good example of any of those messages deserve to be heard. Mm -hmm. And Low Power FM is a good way to hear them. And I would also just like to say that's WCIW in Immokalee, Florida, um, that, that she's speaking about. And, and, and one of, you know, I, I love that station for many reasons, um, and it's very inspiring for many, but one of the most recent things I'd heard from one of the, the people that work there um, was that, you know, people often think of low power FM as being this like low power, and I say high impact, because even though they are only broadcasting to that community, those um, migrant workers that were there take the messages and information that they've learned and, and take it with them when they go to other places and have been able to continue to, um, fight for their rights in other areas outside of that community. So it, it really does have, it shows that the power of information um, and, and education for people uh, really goes much further than just what the 100 watt 
power of an LPFM station can provide. Okay. Uh, I have a question about, uh, and this might be a moot point at, 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 this, at this time, since the FCC has already come out with this, its rules, um, mm -hmm. but what are uh, everyone's opinions on uh, localism requirements uh, for LPFM stations? Because uh, I have noticed that that can be a problem when there's too much networked programming that doesn't actually speak to local needs on an LPFM. So um, unless, I don't know if you both are familiar with what the actual localism requirement is um, for the uh, application that's coming out this October, um, they, you get a preference point if you pledge eight hours or more programming that's locally originated. And that means that it's actually being created by someone in your station. And that can either be a news show or a call-in show, or if you have a DJ that's playing music there, that as long as it's generated from that home base of that station, that that counts towards that localism requirement. Um, and you know, I think, that's, I, I, I think that that requirement uh, and the preference point is, is great. I think it really, it holds the FCC to the accountability of keeping this to be a, a, a radio service that is of use to local communities um, without being re overly restrictive. Um, I think it allows a lot of flexibility for communities to decide how they want to use their station. Um, there may be communities that can fill 24 hours a day with a locally originated programming and that works for them. There may be others that have to have a hybrid um, a kind of pulling in of different, different content uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be syndicated from a large uh, group like NPR or PRI or American Public Media or any of that. And there's like, like you said, it's like there's so many yeah. good independent programmers creating content. It can really um, allow people to bridge and grow and, and take care of what their community actually says they want to hear. So uh, from, from my perspective, I see it as being um, flexible enough to offer. And the other aspect of ensuring that, that localism is honored, which was the point of low power, is that the ownership structure is necessarily mm -hmm. local. That those making the decision about whether to use anything from PRI to EWTN or local is made by people who live and can prove they live in the community in which that radio station, uh, in which it's, it's, uh, it's serving. So that they're making the decisions based on what they, local people, want to see and hear. So there's that kind of preservation of localism that's built into low power FM. And Liz, can you talk a little bit about what you have done in the past to make sure that you're reporting to the FCC so that you don't have a challenge with the license or? Um, what do we have to do? Recently, within the last, so we've been on the air for nine years. Is it seven years, I think, are, are um, our permit expired after seven years, and so I had to reapply uh, to the FCC. And it was very simple, really. We had to run certain scheduled announcements at a certain period of time every day and, uh, or on certain scheduled days. And then we knew that the FCC was going to tune in and listen within this six-month window. And I emailed the station, and I said, this is what's going on. You care about the station? Don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, hit your mark at the top of the hour and do your station ID at, at the top of the hour and don't screw up. And so, you know, our, our interaction with the FCC has been ne nothing. We've, we've never heard from them. Um, my antenna went down and I had to file and say that our antenna was down and that we were working on our antenna and we were um, broadcasting from a, a very reduced signal. And that's something that, that comes with the comes with the territory. But other than that, there's been no problems. I mean, you've just, it's filling out and following directions exactly as they say to do them. And, uh, and that's, what it, that's what it takes. You know, if it says fill this out, fill it out. <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's the FCC, following directions. Yeah. Um, so we've never had any problems. But then we set out, you know, I'm strict in that, you know, we, we've, we have specific broadcast requirements and behavior. And, uh, and we follow those, and those are very clear. Any other questions? We're, we're actually at 5 o'clock, and uh, we have a, another program that we're going to start immediately. We're going to talk to uh, an independent filmmaker, Kevin McKinney, about corporate FM and whether maybe low-power FM will solve all the problems <laughs> that he will outline in his documentary course. So uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, audience. So thank you for coming. Great. <laughs>